Hi friends and welcome back. I'm so excited about our next journey together. So for this series or segment, whatever, we're going to look at different political and economic theories. And as always, my goal is to make the information easier to understand because trust me, some of this is pretty difficult. And as always, if you have questions or comments, put them in the in the comments. Yeah, weird. Uh, down below. So let's go learn some cool things. All right, I've tried to record this video three times now and I just keep trying not to cough. So we have some coffee, some espresso, and some water in case we need it. Welcome back. Today we're gonna do our second video out of three about the book Mutual Aid to Building Solidarity During This Crisis and the Next by Dean Spade published last year in 2020. Last year for one day, for a few more hours. It is New Year's Eve, if you're curious about when I am recording this. Ooh, interesting. I can't use the mask with these gloves on. Well, that's disappointing because look at how fun they are. Okay, so <laughs> um, this is the first section of part two of the book titled Working Together on Purpose. So the main points are chapter four is some dangers and pitfalls of mutual aid. Spade outlines four dangerous tendencies of mutual aid projects. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes my brain works. It's really cool. Um, so one, dividing people into those two groups that we talked about in the first video being the deserving and undeserving. Two, saviorism. Three, being co-opted. And four, collaborating to replace public infrastructure um, with private enterprise and volunteerism. So first off, deserving hierarchies, but You are deserving because you are human, a creature, a thing that has a place in this world. Like I wouldn't even limit deservingness to humans alone. So another horrifying thing that I learned from this book right here uh if you don't have a confirmed address prior to like a confirmed prior address during um fema disaster relief you're generally denied assistance which is this is the world we live in because uh, again government and nonprofit organizations do not seek to undermine or replace current economic status uh, systems or the status quo they seek solely to uphold it so organizations that withhold aid from people with criminal histories mimic charity organizations, which are not mutual aid, because as we all know, a large percentage of felons are wrongly convicted. And even more importantly, when we evaluate the society that we live in, which defines what a felony is and what, which drives people into situations where they carry out acts that are now defined as felonies, uh, it's very clear that those are systemic failures, not poor choices on the part of the individual. Okay, so two. The next section is called saviorism and paternalism. So I actually just made a great TikTok about this. At least I thought it was great. <laughs> TikTok, huh. Um, so saviorism is the idea that someone is in a perceived uh, position of moral, financial, educational, etc., superiority is needed to save those less fortunate people. Some perfect examples are the charity organizations that provide aid to people, but do not seek to change the economic position of the people they're providing the aid to, because if they did that, who then would they be saving? Um, honestly, good examples are things like the United Nations food programs. Uh, oftentimes we industrialized nations send food into places across the globe that actually undermines those local communities' ability to produce and their own food supplies, further perpetuating that whole perception that they need to be saved by some higher authority. And paternalism is, this is a definition that I googled because I realized that I didn't have a good definition off the top of my head, so quote unquote, the policy or practice on the part of people in positions of authority of restricting the freedom and responsibilities of those subordinate to them in the subordinate's supposed best interest 
Um, this is the supposed role of the father in the nuclear family, hence paternal, pa patriarchy, paternal, man, authority figure things. <clears throat> so the idea the, there's this authority figure that knows what's best for the unit and has the ability to restrict the actions of the members for the benefit of those members. Another really good example is actually um, the Patriot Act. So paternalism and saviorism are rooted in the belief that people in perceived position, positions, perceived, <laughs> positions of authority have a moral high ground and should provide assistance to the people that they deem worthy of their help. I put quotes around perceived because it stems from the fact that people believe in their authority. Like if we collectively, collectively decide that the CEOs of nonprofits have no power, then they no longer have power. It is a social construct. They're literally just individual human beings. So they're no better than you, they're no better than me, they're no better than the people that we force to sleep in the streets or the people that turn to drug or alcohol to try to survive this harsh reality that we live in. So definitely keep those two things in mind when you're working with mutual aid organizations. Um, constant evaluation and analysis is important to make sure that you don't fall into those savior or authority type traps because they are the standard, so they're easy to replicate. And that brings us to number three, co-opting. As our government continues to cut funding to services, they push this idea that those gaps should be filled by churches or family, and I think this one idea is so interesting because I'm sure many of us, if you have TikTok and if you are on political TikTok at all, um, saw the TikTok of a woman who moved to the US from China to live with her boyfriend and was so confused about why there were so many people living in tents in the streets. So she explained that back in her country, if someone is homeless, the government buys them a ticket back to their hometown where their family takes care of them until they're back on their feet. So I made a TikTok talking about that point and someone on my video commented and said that the left here in the US is trying to destroy family. That poor soul <laughs> is so misguided. Capitalism and its dedication to the nuclear family is what has destroyed family. American hyper-individualism is what's destroying family. Here in the US, if you sent someone back to their hometown for their family to take care of them, their family would tell them, would not help them. They would tell them to get a job or get their shit together or whatever. The nuclear family, like the institution of the nuclear family, was a way of disconnecting people from the larger community and from our extended families that were the norm in matriarchal societies, so societies that were run by women. We have no extended support networks in this society, which is why mutual aid projects are so important because they provide that support, but also undermine the capitalist agenda of isolating us all from one another. So that's my personal tangent, yeah. Now back to what Spade has to say about co-optation. The narrative that we're sold that this public-private partnership um, runs more efficiently is a lie. We know when things like our health care, our run for profit, the quality of care that we receive depends solely on how much money we have. Also things like vet care, like if you can't pay for an emergency vet visit, they will literally let your pet die. Those things, and obviously I believe nothing, should be run for profit. So co-opting is seen when the media shares those heartwarming stories of community members helping each other in the aftermath of a disaster, so like the local hero trope. While those same news stations willfully refuse to talk about why those individuals, those local heroes, have to step in and provide the relief that was supposed to come from the government in the first place. Or why we continue to see worsening disasters, so climate change and how it is caused by humans. Spade provides a good example of the difference between a mutual aid project and the privatization of services um, that they both serve as alternatives to the current system, but sometimes they're only instituted to help rich people and sometimes they're a form of mutual aid intended to help the entire community. So as our public services continue to degrade, and like we mentioned in that first video about this book, response times get slower. 
private firefighting companies are apparently a thing that's been on the rise. So people that can afford to pay for those private firefighting services receive compensation for their belongings and a place to stay while things are rebuilt, whereas poor people are left to fend for themselves and as we discussed earlier, may actually just be ineligible for services at all. Um, as an alternative, organizations like the Oakland Power Projects work to teach local members of communities terrorized by police violence first aid skills in order to avoid calling the police in the first place. So these are both alternatives to the public services that we currently receive under this system. One protects people that have enough money, the other provides vital knowledge and skills to community members in order to undermine the current structures in that situation that are specifically and willfully harming them. Finally, in this section, Spade talks about feminist movements in the 60s and 70s that were co-opted to rely on the criminalization and lists many organizations that seek to provide mutual aid alternatives to those structures. So I'm gonna find information about those organizations and either post them in the links, post them in the links, post links in the comments or in the description of this video, whatever works best, I'm not sure yet. Which brings us to number four. Spade discusses the characteristics of mutual aid versus charity. So mutual aid is not run like a business. There are no experts or professionals that make a career out of doing mutual aid like you see people do with charity organizations. The point of mutual aid is to be as inclusive as possible, to have as much diversity of experiences and knowledge brought in to provide the best care possible for the entire community. So I'm just gonna read some of the guiding questions Spade puts forward um, for making sure that your mutual aid project doesn't fall into the charity model. So, who controls our project? Who makes decisions about what we do? Do, does any of the funding we receive come with strings attached that limit who we help or how we help? Do any of our guidelines about who can participate in our work cut out stigmatized and vulnerable people? What is our relationship to law enforcement? And how do we introduce new people in our group to our approach with law enforcement? So those are really good questions because again, the constant um, analysis or evaluation of your organization and who and how they're helping is important to make sure that you're reaching your goals and helping your community in the best way possible. So um, biggest takeaways or just some of my favorite soapboxes, really, who knows, debate. debatable. <laughs> um, community care and really, again, in my opinion, everything should be as inclusive as possible. And by that, I mean that there should be no automatic deferment to experts for solutions. Solutions should come about through collective action. Charity is evil and undermines a community's or a population's ability to change their circumstances. Charity only seeks to maintain the current status quo, not to improve the livelihoods or change the current systems that fail to provide the necessities in the first place. Charity is extremely discriminatory and it seeks again to divide the working class into those deserving and undeserving poor. When we work together and collaborate, we can do so much more for our communities. We don't need to have this reliance on outside experts for the answers to our problems. Like we are more than capable of coming up with solutions ourselves. And that's not to say that you shouldn't ask somebody that's knowledgeable about a certain thing, but that you don't have to solely rely on the answers they provide you without also seeking input from community members that would be affected by those actions. So I hope this gives you some good ideas about things you can do in your own community. So like I said, I'll find information about those organizations listed in the book by Spade in case you live in that area and maybe you're interested in getting involved or you don't have any mutual aid groups in your area and you want to start one. Um, definitely do that. So until the next video, whenever I get this mess together and can figure that out, Go forth and do good things. You know, I thought there were buttons on this. Yeah, can I? The button doesn't do anything. Okay, that's weird. Oh, maybe just the size of the thing.
Oh, wait, why? It's not moving. Okay. I just don't know how to use a stylus. That's, that's it. That's the problem here.